All right. Uh, welcome to the Drupal NYC meetup. Uh, so, uh, first housekeeping, uh, mute your devices. Uh, we are recording this, uh, so, uh, and we want everyone to hear questions. Uh, so, uh, we'll have volunteers with a microphone uh, whenever you have a question uh, for one of the presenters. Uh, restrooms, uh, men's restrooms are uh, down that hallway quite a bit. Uh, women's down that hallway. Uh, and yeah, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, and Wi-Fi information is at the bottom of all these slides. Uh, so uh, we have a Slack channel uh, to, uh, if you want to chat, chat with us, uh, connect with other people uh, after the meetup. Uh, and uh, follow us on Twitter. And uh, agenda, doing announcements right now. Uh, we'll have uh, presentations and uh, close up around 8.35, 8.45 and head over to uh, Bill's Bar, Bar Burger uh, sponsor, after party, uh, have drinks sponsored by Fastly. Uh, today's talks, we have uh, introduction to Drupal uh, by uh, JD. Uh, Drupal in five minutes by John. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> Uh, and uh, web form demo uh, by Jacob. Uh, introduction to decoupled. Uh, those are all lightning talks. We'll go, they'll go pretty quick. And then our main presentation uh, for the night is uh, using views. Uh, organizers. Uh, uh, yeah, find us if you have any questions. Say thank you. Uh, they'll have the microphones. And we are a, incorporating a nonprofit to uh, mostly organize the, um, the camps. Uh, so that is moving along. Do we have anyone who wants to? We're pretty much done. I think we're opening the bank account now and filing the 503, 5013C. But this will allow us to start doing the camps again, which is something we haven't done for a while for a couple of reasons in the last year was because the Drupal Association stopped doing the support of the camps. So we had no one to be our sponsor and to handle all the things we need to count and we need to do. And we're always looking for volunteers to help with that. Like everything else, since we're all doing this volunteer basis, the more people we have, the easier it is for other people. Thanks. Uh, and uh, all the uh, pizza and drinks that's all sponsored in this venue, uh, sponsored by NBC Universal. Uh, thank you. They are probably hiring uh, for all sorts of Drupal positions uh, if you're interested. And uh, Fastly, uh, thank you uh, for sponsoring uh, the after party. Uh, uh, please take photos. Uh, and uh, upload them to the event page or uh, hashtag them uh, Drupal NYC. Uh, we'll find them and uh, uh, put them in uh, decks like this and use them otherwise. Uh, Drupal Association. Uh, so I, I work for the Drupal Association. Uh, we sponsor, or, or we build Drupal.org, uh, have an interning team of uh, five people. Uh, put on the Drupal cons and uh, generally try to support the Drupal community. So, uh, yeah, please, uh, please support us. Uh, come to DrupalCon. Uh, there's stickers for the next couple Drupal cons in the back. Please take those so I don't have to take them home. And uh, join us on Slack. Uh, a few upcoming events uh, Nerd Summit later this month. That is in, is that Massachusetts? Yeah, yeah Amherst. Uh, Midcamp in Chicago and uh, DrupalCon, uh, where are we going? Seattle, that is coming up uh, next month. And uh, if you're interested in speaking, we're always looking for speakers. Uh, 
any length, uh, any, uh, any level, and of course Drupal exists alongside uh, all sorts of other stuff uh, uh, in various web stacks, decoupled, uh, so anything, anything adjacent to Drupal is welcome too. Uh, and uh, yeah, contact one of the organizers, uh, go ahead and fill out our uh, form, drupal.nyc slash suggest. Uh, if you have something you'd want to hear or uh, something you want to talk about, uh, go ahead and fill it out uh, right now before you, uh, before you forget about it. Uh, who's hiring? Uh, go ahead and uh, raise your hands if you're uh, looking to hire someone. And uh, have a few people, so we'll be. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm with a company called Linkwell. We do um, content marketing programs and we're looking for uh, a senior software developer right here in Midtown. Hi, uh, Ken Javier. Uh, work at the uh, Gilda Lerman uh, uh, nonprofit organization. We're looking for a uh, developer or DevOps uh, right here in Midtown. Hi, my name is Aaron. I work at one of the IT departments at Columbia University, and we're hiring a front-end developer who has Drupal experience. Hi, I'm Matt Ravenel. I work with IBM, and we're currently hiring for a Drupal architect and a QA lead. So anyone else over here? Yeah. I'm Greg Kallenberg, and I work for the New York Public Library, and we're also looking for a senior uh, application developer um, who has strong PHP skills. As well as others. Anyone else? Yes. yes uh, my name is Agron Baut. I'm a web developer at Barnard College, and we are hiring a Drupal developer for our new portal. Uh, Drupal developer. All right. Uh, to, uh, I think we got everyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, if you're looking for work, uh, go ahead and find, uh, find uh, any of them. And uh, I'm sure uh, most of them will be at the after party uh, afterwards. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, take five minutes, uh, introduce yourself to your neighbors, uh, someone, you, someone new. And uh, we'll interrupt you uh, five minutes later. All right, can continue your conversations at the after party at Bill's. Uh, and uh, we'll have this slide again, but uh, next meetup tentatively April 3rd. Uh, we're still NBC, they have, um, I think there's new TV shows or something coming out every year. Uh, I think uh, they need the space for uh, uh, something else every April. So uh, we're looking for a venue for April. Uh, so that date might move around. Uh, if you have a venue, if you know a venue that uh, uh, would fit a group like this, uh, let us know. Um, and uh, yeah, follow the meetup page for, uh, for updates. And uh, yeah, again, uh, definitely, uh, let us know if you uh, have something you want to he uh, hear about in, that, in a future meetup or uh, want to talk about. Let's see. And our after party, uh, that'll be Bell's Bar and Burger. Do we? I think I just skipped to the end. All right. Uh, JD. Uh, so JD has an uh, introduction to Drupal.
Is there a button that needs to be pressed? <laughs> hey, good deal. Hey everyone, I'm JD, uh, and I'm going to give you a quick lightning talk uh, about what Drupal is. Um, but actually, before we get to this, <laughs> I jumped ahead. I know we're, we're talking about what is Drupal, but actually I'm going to get something started in the background here. Um, we're going to jump right ahead to how do you, how can you start uh, building with Drupal super quickly. Um, so I use a service called Pantheon. It's a Drupal optimized hosting platform. Um, and this is by far, in my opinion, the easiest way uh, for a beginner to get started with a Drupal installation. Because you don't have to worry about servers. You don't have to worry about, you know, getting anything set up. You just press a few buttons and I'm going to show you how to do that right here. Uh, the reason I'm going to do this first is because it takes a little while to like spin everything up. So I'm going to let this happen in the background uh, while I explain <laughs> what Drupal is. All right, so this is so I signed up for a Pantheon account. It's free. Uh, you get free developer sites um, where you can just play around. You don't have to pay anything, no credit card or anything like that until you actually launch a site. Um, so just name the site and uh oh, that one already exists. Go figure. What do you think? Hey, hey, all right. <laughs> and then you get a choice of what you want to install. Um, we're going to ignore WordPress at the top there. <laughs> uh, and we want to uh, install Drupal 8. And there it goes. <laughs> so that's just going to spin in the background. It's spinning up cloud environments, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and we're going to jump back to, uh, to what Drupal is. All right, so as you may have already seen, <laughs> uh, Drupal's the third most popular content management system uh, behind WordPress, uh, which is by far the most popular, uh, and Joomla, uh, which I still don't understand why it's so popular. Um, <laughs> then, um, so Drupal is sometimes described as a content management framework. Uh, it's a really flexible system uh, that's, you know, uh, typically used as a repository for structured content. You'll hear, you'll hear the phrase structured content a lot when you're dealing with Drupal. Um, and you'll see some of the presentations later today. We'll, we'll touch more on that. Um, you know, it has an optional but very commonly used front end uh, user interface uh, through which users uh, can edit that content um, and or uh, visitors, so people who aren't authenticated, they haven't logged in with Drupal, uh, can, can view that content, possibly interact with it. Uh, Drupal 8, uh, which is the most recent uh, version of Drupal out there, major version, uh, is built uh, using PHP on top of the Symfony framework. And uh, Drupal core is a phrase that you'll hear a lot. Drupal core refers to basically the thing you download from drupal.org when you're installing Drupal. Um, it's kind of the key components, the key functionality for Drupal. Uh, it provides a lot. Uh, one of the most important things that it provides is uh, basically a, a plug-in kind of framework. Um, so we, there's a plug-in framework from Symfony. Uh, then Drupal has a module uh, kind of framework uh, for Drupal modules that provide a ton of additional functionality. Uh, and so Drupal core comes with a whole bunch of core modules, we call them. Um, some kind of basic, simple things. And then uh, where Drupal's power really comes from is its incredible repository of contributed modules, uh, often referred to as just contrib. Um, so, you know, if, if you can dream up something that you want to do with a website, there's probably a contrib module out there that will help you do it. Um, so, you know, just kind of a last point, uh, Drupal's extremely uh, extensible or flexible, uh, and you can do almost anything with it. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking to myself, does it let me do X? Can I do Y? The answer is undoubtedly yes. Uh, the harder question is how can I get it to do that? Um, often there are a ton of different ways um, that you can use Drupal to, you know, do a particular thing, and it's, it can be a real challenge to figure out what the best way is or even what, what some of your options are. Um, so I'll talk just briefly about system requirements for Drupal. Um, so it's based on PHP, so you do need PHP on your web server. Uh, it supports PHP 5.5 uh, and higher for now. Um, starting with Drupal 8.7 though, uh, you'll need 5.6. Uh, but PHP 7 is definitely preferred. Uh, it's more performant, faster, um, you know, and it's the future. So definitely go with that if you can. Uh, also critically, you need a database server. Um, there, there are lots of options out there, but Pretty much everyone uses MySQL or MariaDB, they're the best supported, uh, but there is a pluggable database backend, so you could plug in other databases. Uh, and then, obviously, a web server. 
Uh, people typically use Apache uh, or Nginx. So let's take a peek, see what's going on on Pantheon. Complete. Okay. So we've deployed Drupal 8 to our new Pantheon site and we're going to visit our Pantheon site dashboard. Uh, so here we are and basically it's, it's deployed the code uh, for Drupal up to the cloud uh, and now we're going to hit install Drupal and that's basically launching our website. And here we are, we're installing Drupal. Uh, so this is Drupal 8.6.10 which is the most recent release. Um, uh, Drupal 8.7 uh, is coming soon. I don't remember when, November maybe? That's not that soon. June? I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. Might as well install the, the demo Drupal. Um, so these are installation profiles which basically are kind of preset um, configuration and modules that get installed. Um, and so this umami uh, installation profile is uh, designed to let people demo Drupal. And honestly, I have never installed that before. <laughs> We're making history here. Almost there. Uh, but what's really cool about Pantheon, um, you know, as far as getting started is, you know, as you can see, it's just a few clicks. Uh, it's really fast to get up and running. Uh, and they will actually let you develop the website without having a local development environment. So you can actually develop in the cloud. Um, uh, it, it will commit your changes to the Git uh, source code repository um, that comes with Pantheon. Uh, and that's a really easy way to get started site building. You don't need any development experience. Um, you know, you can start playing around with Drupal uh, without having to do any coding. Uh, really great way to, to dive in. Um, certainly there are, there are important things that you should be doing when you like really start developing. <laughs> You're gonna want a local development environment. You're gonna wanna get set up um, you know, to, to use the best practices when you're developing as far as using source control, um, if you're going to be working with others especially, uh, and as well as deployment. Um, uh, I like Pantheon because it's, it helps you with a lot of those things and it provides a lot of documentation to help kind of guide you through that. It's in many ways specific to Pantheon because they've got their own kind of opinionated way for, uh, you know, how you develop uh, up in the cloud and locally. Um, but uh, I think it's a great best practice to follow. So if you don't know where to start, this is my personal recommendation. Um, there are plenty of other uh, hosting options out there. Uh, Pantheon's on the, on the more expensive side. Um, uh, another expensive option is Acquia. Uh, they provide cloud hosting as well that's Drupal optimized. Um, what else is out there? Shout it out. Platform, platform.sh. Yeah, that's not the big one. Um, and I definitely do recommend uh, these Drupal optimized hosting platforms because um, they really help you kind of stick to best practices. All right, so we're configuring our site here. Don't hack me. It's a really weak password just for you. All right, we're just going to leave that all alone. Uh, and I'm, I'm not really going to go through the, the demo site with you. I'm going to leave, leave kind of the, the demo of, of Drupal functionality to some of the other presenters today. Uh, but I do want to just get to the point of, hey, we've installed Drupal and it's, it's time to party. There we are. So we have our Umami Food Magazine. Um, so demo content, you know, using Drupal. Um, so you can see there's kind of, there's content here, it's, it's structured content. <laughs> um, you know, there, there are probably some fields and, um, you know, obviously there's, there's some images and other things and they're, that are associated kind of with the primary node content that's in here. Um, yeah, and there's, uh, we're, we're logged in as admin here. We've got our, uh, you know, control, or uh, toolbar at the top here, admin toolbar, where we can do a bunch of configuration and site building uh, and we can start modifying the structure of the content, add new content, um, et cetera. Um, so that's all I've got for you. Uh, if you have basic questions about what is Drupal <laughs> or installing Drupal requirements, uh, I think we probably have like a minute or two for that. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on to some more demos. Any questions? Right in the back there. And uh, please uh, wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. 
the as the versions come out, are they is there a, a beta alpha aspect to them, or are they just considered ready to rock and roll when they come out? Uh, good question. So. Um, they go through kind of an extensive QA process before they're released. So when you see a version number um, like 8.6.10, uh, um, that is a, a fully fledged version. Um, each version builds upon the, the last. Uh, and where you see beta versions uh, actually comes uh, with the major versions, in between the major versions. So uh, before Drupal 8.0 was released, uh, you, had, you had alphas, betas, uh, release candidates, and then it was released. Um, but once it gets to a stable point, uh, every additional release is considered stable. Oh, there's 8.7 alpha, I'm told. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so uh, I guess uh, in Drupal 8 we've got, I don't know what we call it, what's 8.7 relative to 8.6? It's not a major release, is it? Minor release? Minor feature release, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess with the, the minor feature releases, uh, I think you're more likely to, to get an alpha beta um, before it's released because there are potentially uh, greater changes to functionality, uh, possibly some minor backward compatibility changes. Um, are there any recommended, other than MAMP, I guess, uh, local development environments? Yes. <laughs> Which um, ones? There are so many options out there. Um, my personal favorite is Lando, um, and uh, we are hoping, we have been penciled in the, the uh, project lead for Lando to come uh, for our May meetup. Um, uh, and it's, it's a great way to, to do local development, uh, and it works, you can get it to work with pretty much kind of any setup. Um, one of the great things is they integrate very tightly with Pantheon. Um, so if you do want to get started on Pantheon, Lando is a kind of easy way to then pull down your cloud site that you've started to play with uh, to your local environment and work on it locally. Uh, but ev everyone, like there are a ton of options out there. Uh, you just do a little Googling, you'll find a, a lot of different kind of Drupal local development environments. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we have uh, John, who also uh, will, knows about Drupal hosting, and uh, he's going to show us uh, how to build something. Hi. Thank you, JD. Uh, so this is kind of a impromptu lightning talk and so I figured let's just do something and, I'll do, and I'm going to basically decided instead of building something and this is perfect since this is what JD just did, right? This is like Drupal out of the box is capable of all this stuff so let's like, ha, seems like a lot of people are totally new to Drupal here, right? Maybe? A lot? I'm not going to make the newbies raise their hands, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to set a timer and we're going to like hammer through this thing as quickly as possible in five minutes say like this is how this is put together, blah, blah, blah. So that should be fun. <clears throat> um, and and go. go. Okay, so this is the home page of this site. Uh, we call them blocks and things. I forgot to log in, so let me log in here real quick. Actually, that's a good point. This is called an unauthenticated user session. <laughs> we don't know who you are, so you're not logged in, so it shows you different things, like you see a login button as, as opposed to admin menus and all these other things. Uh, there's a link to reset your password. You will always forget your password. That's why Drupal has a way to send it back to you. Well, it doesn't actually do that. It sends you a link and then you can reset your password. So always in Drupal, when you click the login button, you'll see this forgot your password thing or whatever, uh, and you can do that. <clears throat> uh, Drupal has built-in search. It has built-in content, like we said, images, blocks, all of these things. These are probably blocks. We'll dig in in a minute, figure out what those are. Uh, these are links to things. I don't know what that is necessarily. These look like they might be tags, but typically the stuff across the top is called a menu or primary links, and you can click them. This is like the main navigation of your site, home, articles, recipes. These are a million ways to build these particular pages, but we don't really know how, because we don't care, we're just reading it, so it just looks like a website to us. But if we log in here, I have a special login thing, I don't even know the password, but I just have a button. And then 
you're an admin page. This is like the admin user is user one. You have superpowers. You can destroy everything. <laughs> Which means you'll log into stuff and be like, that it doesn't even look right because you have too much power. Like if you go to a, an article or something, like, or the home page, <clears throat> it actually looks pretty good now in Drupal 8. You just have this edit button in the top right. This magic. Whoa, so all these things appear now. You guys don't even know how lucky you are. <laughs> Quick edit. You click these little blocks and you're like, I think I want to edit this text here. And you could just click quick edit. And it like highlights the stuff you can edit. And you just click it and you're like, it's really easy. And you just hit save and it's actually done. And that's it. It's changed live. So I'm not even like, this is crazy stuff. But this is all Drupal out of the box. This isn't any special extra modules. There's a lot of modules built in. So you will like see all sorts of stuff you're not even you don't even know what it is and you probably don't care until you want until you go in here and check them all off. You're gonna play around all day, like activity tracker that does what it probably says it does, but none of that stuff matters. Okay, let's get to the the guts of it. Your admin menu across the top is broken into these sections. Content is like all the stuff people are posting. So you can just add a blogger and they'll just add add new blog posts. They won't necessarily see like the giant all this extra stuff. Uh, this is the main content page. You can kind of scroll and see what the title is. Usually you click the type, the headers. There's things called content types, which I'll jump in because we only have five minutes. The content type defines what kind of fields and stuff are on it. So like this is an article. It's like a chocolate milk recipe or whatever. And up at the top, again, you see these tabs on every Drupal node, which is what all contents are nodes. Whether it's a blog post or an event or anything, you can build whatever you want and you call it article, you call it what you need. There's view, there's always a view tab, we call it, an edit tab, and usually a delete or some other tabs that show up. If you click edit, you get this nice and ugly non-quick edit D. This is the Drupal form that we all have there's a love-hate relationship with, We're trying to make it better. But whatever, you can basically click and edit all these things. Each one of these is a field, and you can just drag and drag these things around in the on another page. We can show you how you can kind of configure these things. But it's kind of what you'd expect if you've ever done anything like on a blog or whatever, even like live journal or whatever. You can put pictures and add tags and things like that. And then it's got, it's a great publishing system, so there is a built-in like draft, published, archived feature. Um, and there's like even revision logs over here and like easy way to put it in the menu. Um, you know, so it's really quick, pretty easy to just say like I want this, this post to have a special menu link here in the main navigation. Uh, and that's called the menu system. Uh, there's URL aliases, they call it. So you can see up here it's node two, and that's not very appealing. So you add an alias, and then it's nice and long and easily readable. It's better for your SEO. You hit save, and like that change is made, and it even added, you can see it added up here in the primary links, which I can say, oh, wait, that's not what I wanted. I didn't want it at the front. I can just click this edit button, click edit menu. We call a list of links a menu, and you can see there it is at the top. Drupal has this easy way to drag and drop things all the time and reorder them. So anywhere you see these little things, you can click and drag, re rearrange it, hit save, and then that's it, changes the menu. And there you go, you got a different menu order. Say that's still ugly, I want to change the text. And that's five minutes. <laughs> Six minutes. Structure, content types, this is where all the magic happens. Article, basic page, recipe. Look at this, you can manage fields and like, it's, it's wild. So you can, a recipe has many more things than an article, for example, cooking time. Ingredients, uh, but you, in Drupal you can really click and drag around everything. So like even how it's displayed, you can say, "Oh, the tags are up here. I want them way down here." You can just click and drag, and that changes like where it even shows up. Um, if I do that, do the same thing for article. So we can kind of make that change. So we can see what we just did. Manage display. Say, "Oh no, I want the uh, the body above the image for some reason." I just click it, drag it, save it. And then when I go back to my site with this link up here, and I click Dairy Free and Delicious, you can see the. Yeah. Did I put the body above the image? That's what I just did, right? Yeah. Anyway, that's Drupal. <laughs> you just go nuts and you figure out why didn't that work? Why did that work? And click, 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 click. So that was my lightning talk. Drupal in five minutes. Was that enough? JD, should I go longer? <laughs> Questions? Microphone here.
<laughs> Say that again. It's with my What's that uh, dashboard thing you're using? Is that Pantheon? Oh no, this is my own. This is uh, my hosting system called uh, DevShop. Oh, it's, it's very similar. But you just click and create a site because all the opsy things in the databases are hard. Anyone else? Sweet. So now you all know Drupal in and out. Go go uh, build stuff. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, now we have uh, Jacob, uh, maintainer of the web form module, and um, can I do a demo uh, for web, uh, web form? Good job. Uh, John did a great job of like setting me up for this because Webform is a contributed module. So we're going to explore something that doesn't come with Drupal Core when you install it. You have to go and download it or use Composer to get it on your system. Oh, and this is sorry. Looking the wrong screen. I looked up and I was like, what? So I'm going to give a demo of the Web4 module. Um, I'll explain what it is. I'm doing a much larger demo at um, Nerd Summit, and I'm just taking a small section of the demo to just show you some actual functionality. And I only have three slides from the larger deck. Uh, my name is Jake Rockwitz. I'm known as I, I'm known as Jay Rockwitz on the web. I'm a Drupal developer and software architect. I built and maintained the Web4 module for Drupal. And also to give a time check, I'm aiming for 15 minutes here. So the web form module is a powerful and flexible open source form builder and submission manager for Drupal 8. Um, this is my kind of elevator pitch. It provides all the features expected from an enterprise proprietary form builder combined with the flexibility and openness of Drupal. When I say form builder, it's like SurveyMonkey, where you can go onto a site, build a form, collect some data. And the use case for the web form module, I kind of break it down into these steps, which is, you know, you build a form, you can also copy a template. You publish that form um, as a page, like a web page on a Drupal site. You can publish it as a node, which is what John was showing you, where you can add it to a node. Or you can even put it on a block. Like any page on your site can just have a form sitting at the bottom, like a subscribe to a mailing list. And then when people submit that form, you're collecting submissions. And those submissions can then send confirmation notifications and emails. Um, you can review those results because you're collecting them. And then you can distribute those results by either you know, generating a CSV or even remote posting it to like a CRM or third party. And I break it down to these are the three key things to use case. You're building a form, collecting data, and distributing the data. And what I want to demo is an event registration system, which is a very common use case for almost every organization that does any, anything that involves people, where you're a college or a medical institution. And this is a very, you know, it's a screenshot of the demo. And it's just, um, we're building an event form, which, you know, you're basically taking a title, date, and then you're collecting information about the user. And this process, I have a slide where I'm walking through, but we're just going to, I'm going to walk through the plan here, what I'm trying to demo, how I'm going to do it, what's the kind of specifications. And then once we do the first build, we'll go back in and do some improvements. So we're just trying to wire, basically we're trying to wireframe the functionality for an event registration system and then make it look cool. Um, so the plan here is, you know, we want to allow users to register to an event, and I'm putting in parentheses, that's a node. An event is a piece of content on your site. And then the registration form, which would include, like, the event information, event and contact information, that's a web form. That's a form to collect data. And then admins can review the registrants, the registrations, which are submissions. And I kind of include this glossary, which helps to transition from what John was showing you, is so... What I, the web form module specializes in is forms that collect submissions. And that data collected is from a web form is a submission. And then we're switching gears because we're starting to talk about events, which is what John was talking about, a page. And you're getting into a content type. So an event is a content type, a page is a content type, an article 
and in the case of the Unami theme, a recipe was a content type. And just in the back end system, content types create nodes. We don't tend, we, the content nodes is synonymous, like, they mean the same thing in Drupal, but when you look at the code, they're called nodes. And, and then what's really important and what's a really powerful thing about um, Drupal and all that field stuff is you can create relationships. And we tend to call them references, like entity references, node references. Um, you can have your, you know, your recipes reference the restaurants that they're served in. Or in this case, we're gonna have events you know, there's gonna be a reference to a registration. So what we're gonna build is a web form, what I kind of described, event and contact information, and then we're gonna add a confirmation page, which is automatic, and then an email and a notification. And the event will be an event content type with a date field and a web form field attached to it so that the web form can be rendered under the event. So once we build this, the test that we're gonna to wanna to walk through is Creating the event, generating a registration, checking the confirmation page, confirm that the events are working in the correct way, customizing the results, and maybe even just look at resending the confirmation email. All right, so the demo, the way I'm doing this is this is a clean, I'm gonna make this a lot bigger for everyone. Okay. It's a clean install. I have some notes here so that I don't lose track of things. And we are going to event registration. So the first thing we want to do is start on the web form, which is a registration form. I made the decision to do a lot of cutting and pasting. Um, just a quick work, this is the web form module. It installs by default the contact form. I'll quickly just show you kind of the lay of the land so when I'm jumping around. It's a very simple contact form. There's a form builder that shows you all the elements that you can edit and control. I'm gonna start you know, manipulating a little bit more and I'm gonna add a new form code registration, I'm gonna hit save. It's blank, I'm gonna show you the add element UI but I have a cut and paste snippet to kind of show you. So let's say we're adding a text field and we wanted to get someone's name, we could type your name, set it to required, hit save, and you can see we started building out the form. I don't wanna build out this entire form so what I'm gonna to jump to is there's the ability to edit the source code behind the form and this is the raw data that's building this form on the fly. Um, in Drupal, getting a little technical, it's called a render array. It's like a definition of what the input you wanna lay out. And I have a snippet here that I'm gonna put in place and I will explain everything in this snippet. It makes it a lot easier to demo things because, boom, I'm gonna paste it in here. And you can go in and customize this to your heart's content. Um, for the demo, I'm gonna just bring up one thing. Drupal supports this concept of tokens, which is kind of a representation of a piece of information. And these two tokens are going to pull the title of the event in and the date of the event. And actually what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna get a validation error. So the error, when you scroll down, it's gonna say that this token is not valid, it doesn't exist. And the reason it doesn't exist is I haven't created the event yet with a field called date on it. And I'm gonna jump over to a different tab. I hope we won't lose this. Over to content type. So now we're getting into what creating a custom content type. And it's a very simple content type because we spec'd it out. It's called events. I'm gonna hit save, I'm not gonna customize. Drupal ships with reasonable defaults and so does the web form module. You don't have to go too crazy. And I'm gonna add a date to this. I'm gonna call it date. I'm not changing anything. I'm gonna keep it as simple as a date. And then the last thing I wanna add, so we wanna make sure we can add the registration form to the event. I'm gonna reuse the web form field. Not customizing anything, I just wanna emphasize that. I'm just gonna, boom, we have an event content type. Even before I demo this so I don't forget, I'm gonna go over here and hit save. Now it works and you have your elements. Um, I'm gonna come back to that content type but you kinda, you know, you're creating a relationship so you kinda have to create both elements at the same time and work back and forth. Um, Jumping back to this, I just want to walk through what that snippet created when I pasted it in. Um, here's the view of it. So these are two tokens. So I'm going to pull in the title and date of the event. And then this is all this contact information. It's being generated from one element, which is called a composite element. I'm going to give you a quick glance of it. So it allows you to kind of just have all this composite information, the name of the person, the company, you can customize this to your heart's content. You can remove out 
remove properties. I'm not going to go through too much, but start to get the idea. Okay. Close this out. This is why I have notes too. We have our event content type. I'm going to go back to that, but let's focus on the form. I'm going to send a confirmation email. Go over to settings, handler. So handlers handle submissions. And we've jumped into settings. There's a lot of configuration settings. I mean, a quick thing for people new to the web form module. So broken down in a hierarchical sense. We have general information. You have your form. The form creates submissions, so you can customize your submissions. And then you also display confirmations. And then you can also route this data using handlers. And the last two, CSS and jo um, JavaScript, is just adding custom CSS and JavaScript. Um, for the handler, we're going to just add an email. And we're going to send a confirmation email to the person who filled out this form. And it shows you all the fields. And it's the, well, to the contact email. And we're going to customize the subject with some nice tokens. Custom subject. Customize the body and just say, hey. Boom. And there's one last thing I want to do is go in here and turn on this useful debugging setting. And what this will do is show us what's happening in the background. And go back here. And now we're going to test this. And this is where we can go from here. We have our content type. I'm going to go back here and test it by going into content. Oh, there's a better way to test it. I'll just show it to you from here. We're on the registration form. If you go over to references, web forms track where they're being used on your site. So this gives me the ability to add an event that automatically has the relationship to this registration form. So when I click add event, it's going to create an event node. There are multiple ways to get to this. I want to quickly just point out, if you go to the content here, you can go to add content and say add an event as well. The difference here is you'd have to select your event, the registration form. And let's call this event 01. I'm going to set the date into the future. PM. You can control whether it's open or closed. You can schedule the form to appear at different times. Pretty wise on an event to close the form when the event has passed. And you can do that right here. Just click the you know, set schedule. I'm going to hit save. And we now have an event. It says the date of the event. There's a web form associated with it. And we can even fill this out. Hit test. Hit register. And this is the email. And it'll just show you. Oh, by the way, this is that HTML markup kicking in. But it's showing you that the tokens kicked in. And it just sent a confirmation email to me. Backing up. I'm going to actually jump back to i already be clicking back, but I really want to show this tab tracks all the events that you're creating. So if I add another event, and the event is called 02, go here, boom, okay, auto for that. I'm going to hit test, do one more registration, I'm going to click back. And what I want to show is a really cool feature is we've taken one form and we've used it multiple times. And each of these instances track the registrations for just this instance. So we just have one submission for this event 02 and event 01 as a submission. So we pretty much walk through the test. The last thing just to throw out what happens with events is people say, I didn't get the email. And there's the ability to resend it where it just shows you the emails that went out and you can kind of decide. You can even tweak it, customize it, add a note to it. Three minutes? I'm OK. OK. So now we're just going to improve this. And I'll walk through this fairly quickly. We're going to add additional guests so multiple people can come. Add AJAX support. I'm gonna, we're going to look at scheduled email. I think I'm going to skip scheduled email handlers and go to the modal dialog so that we focus on the building aspect of the form to make the form work nicer, a better user experience. So if we're back to the form. Web forms. There's a registration form. Here, I'll go here. We're going to add some guests. And what we're going to do is take a composite element, that's a group of things working together, and add the guests to the bottom here. 
And what this property does is say collect multiple guests, multiple names. And this is actually saying disable the title, middle name, and the degree of the person. And if we switch over, we're going to be able to get multiple guests at the bottom. Sorry to go so fast, but I'm getting pressure. And now we're going to do three things. To, uh, actually, two key things. Ajax apply the form and get the, the confirmation page to work with Ajax. We go over to settings, hit use Ajax, so that it doesn't hit the server. It hits the server but doesn't refresh the page. And confirmation gives you a little warning that inline that inline confirmations work a little better. And we can even demo this. Click here. And it refreshes on the page. Now the problem I have with this user experience is. It's a little clunky to have the giant form at the bottom of the event. And it's much simpler to open up in a modal dialog, which is supported. And the way you can do that, and now we're switching into the, not the form display, but the manage display. And I'm going to make it a little cleaner. You can hide all the labels, because we don't really need to say date, because people know what a date is. We don't need to say it's a web form, because they don't care. But here, we can say link to the form, go in, change the label, register, add a class, button, hit update, hit save, and we'll go in here and hit refresh. And now we have a nice clean register button. And if you click on it, I made one mistake. I forgot to say dialog. Refresh. Fill out the form. There's nothing required, so I can just hit submit. And boom, you have a clean user experience for events. Okay, that was my demo. I just walked through a ton of stuff. You can ask questions. Where you, um, you know, there's slides to say there's a ton of resources for the web form module and videos that walk through a lot of this. There's even this demo installed in the web form module. You, you can install the module and kind of walk through. Uh, hey, thanks, Jacob. One question there. If, if we want to submit that form to a, a non-origin-based endpoint, like imagine going to a lead management system or a CRM somewhere, yeah. is there the ability to basically intercept and make sure that it doesn't actually go into the CMS but go somewhere else? Yeah, there's two features to quickly walk through. And I'll do it on a contact form. So we're on the contact form. There's two things that you're going to want to do. You're going to want to disable the saving of submission so it doesn't go into the database. I want to emphasize there's some nuance here. It still hits the server, which is okay. It never sits on the server. If the information comes through, it goes into memory, and then so I'm going to hit disable. And then under handlers, there's a remote post handler. And if you hit handler, remote post, you can pick endpoints to push the data to. Uh, yeah, and it goes right. But it, you know what's nice is it handles all the validation, takes care of that the user experience. But you can even go in and decouple the form completely by changing the form action. We're getting technical, but you can change the form action to go to any server. Um, so it doesn't even hit Drupal. And if you need a certain level of security, it's kind of a useful thing. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, all of this so far has been uh, Pretty much just uh, Drupal, uh, but Drupal also has a uh, API for web services and uh, headless uh, development. Uh, so Gary Gay is going to uh, get into some of that. Good evening. My name is Gergay. I'm, I'm a, one of the co-founders of Chapters. It's a web development company focusing on Drupal with offices in, in Europe and in, in New York. And uh, so, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, Bicouple Drupal. I guess first I should explain what Bicouple Drupal is. And even if after I do, I think some of you will, will be wondering why, why, why is it 
a thing, but um, but this is I, I can assure you that this is one of the hot, hottest topics uh, regard, uh, when it comes to Drupal these days. So um, you know when you have a, a website, um, John showed you how to how to do things on it and and, and JD. Uh, so yeah, that's so when 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 um, you build a uh, website. People can can visit it and see it in their browsers, but sometimes you that's not what you want. So the couple Drupal is when you when you want your Drupal system to actually communicate with other systems and not with with the browsers and uh, people directly. So that's when it it comes to uh, so that that's what decoupling Drupal is about. Using only the back end of the of the system and not the front end, no no HTML output, because when your system is talking to another system, it's the language is usually not HTML. It's that would not be um, efficient. Uh, so systems usually just send data in a structured way, uh, very specific sets of data, and that's that's basically that's that's what decoupled is. And when if you think that's okay, that's not really relevant to me. Well, it can still be, I mean, it does not mean, uh, so what I mean is that, of course, you can use it to, let's say, you're building a system for your company that, I don't know, displays the, the time remaining for the, last, uh, to, for the next train to arrive, and yeah, so in that case, you just need just a very small piece of data that you need to, no HTML, no design or what's, whatsoever, but um, maybe you want, let's say, you're building a website and you also want to have um, a mobile app. And of course you want to use the same backend, you want to, say it to store the data in the same place, so you want the same data, the same users, the same content, in both on your website and in your mobile app. And that's when, when it comes to, um, like that, that's when, when decoupling uh, uh, can be a very useful um, approach. So. Yeah, uh, so let, let me show you how, how you can do it. And so I'm not going to use the, the Umami demo framework for this. Um, I'm actually just kidding. I'm, of course, going to use the... Uh, so uh, I guess it's... Familiar by now. Uh, okay, so so John sh uh, showed you how you can, for example, change the the, um, uh, the title of, of a post or some do, do things like that. But uh, let me show you how you can do it, um, not through the the website, but but just through an API. Uh, APIs are you know uh, the, the points of communication between systems. Yeah, I'm simplifying here. So um, I actually most of the functionality is in Drupal 8 is, is built in. Uh, I download. I, I used only one. Mo uh, let me make it bigger. So uh, I used only one module, and even that functionality is in Drupal core. I just used the, this um, module to. Uh, it provides just a, U, uh, a UI, a user interface. So it's you don't have to edit config files directly. You can just click. Uh, in Drupal, uh, so the, the REST UI is, is, is one of the modules that we're going to use. And so John has, has showed you that you can go and, and uh, so this is, this is the content page and these are the, 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 the so-called nodes that, that uh, the, the pieces of content in Drupal. And um, so let, let's say we want to, to, you know, for example, we have a, a mobile app and we want to display this piece of, of uh, content in it. So it, um, yeah, so when you edit it, you can see that it's a node slash one, so, so one is the, the, the ID of the, of the node, and uh, so this is something that we can, uh, can I, I'm sorry. So we're going to use a, a a tool for it because I did not create another system just to, for this communication. So I'm going to use the Postman, the, a, a tool called Postman, and what it does is um, basically you can it will it, we will use it we will simulate the other system with this. 
but first let's let's just um, let's just uh, expose the our content through an API. So the way we, you do it, just be, because I, I enable this uh, REST UI, I, in, in my configuration uh, page, I have a REST. Um, yeah, so I have this, this part of, of, the, of, of the configuration. These are the, the resources that I can expose and I want to expose some the content. Uh, so I'm going to enable that. And here I can choose what what uh, methods I want. So get is when you 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 get I can retrieve the, the the data. Post is when you post something. I mean, send uh, or create. Uh, we have delete. That's uh, I guess that's self-explanatory. And patch is when you want to update something. And you can even uh, select the format. We are going to use JSON. That's that's um, that's um more or less the, the standard, that I, like the most, most typical way to these days. And of course we have authentication. A basic auth is one of the, the authentication methods that are provided by, by Drupal core. So, okay, so I enabled, I'm enabling this. Um, and okay, let's say I don't want anyone to delete anything, just post, like create and whatever. So these, these are my options. And, um, this means that now this one, this uh, endpoint, API endpoint is, is, is uh, available now. So if I go to node slash, node is, this is the ID, so node slash one, I can get it not just through the HTML version, but, but the JSON version as well. So let me, uh, I actually cre created um, this um, call already. So Postman is a system that lets you Oh, how could I make it bigger? Hmm? What? Apple Plus. I, yeah, I'm. You want to try? I, I don't think. So yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, but there are screens all around you, so maybe you can see, look at the, the one that's closer. I'm, I'm sorry about this. But anyway, so this is the URL. You just set it up. You, you set the format to JSON, uh, and this is it. You send the request, and it will give you the it will give you the, the output in in a structured array of. of like you get the body, you get the, the, the title, you get all the information about that node. So if you, if your your mobile app, you, you, you in your mobile app, you can use the, that those pieces that you need and, and just display them. And uh, of course, if I change change it to node node three, then that then I will get the the, the third node's data. So this is it. And of and um, but sometimes you want more than just one node. And I know that the next um, the, ne the next uh, session will be about views, Drupal views, which is uh, the tool of Drupal that makes it possible to easily create lists. And uh, so in this Umami um, distribution, we already have a, a list of, of uh, I mean, um, several lists. And let's just use let, for example, this is a, this is a recipe site, so let's let's edit the recipe list, which gives us this output, the the list of recipes. But let's say we want to have a JSON output. We want we want an, a list that is consumed by by our mobile app, and we want we want to to display things that way. So I'm going to create a REST export and. Uh, I need to give it a path. Let's, I don't know, make it API recipes. Yeah. And, um, okay, I want to authenticate it. 
okay, cool. And set the permission, whatever. And this is it. Basically now, you can see the preview. I get a, like all this data that is, is not really, not easily readable for humans, but, but this is what, what the other systems can easily uh, work with. So this is what we have, and, um, and I even, I mean, I did not configure anything, I, I just get all the, the content, uh, that, that all the recipes. I even can make it, um, like, uh, this one, so I can, I can set other options, and uh, I can even, even um, change the, the, the structure, so I don't need the whole entity, the, all, all the, the data, I just want, for example, some of the, the, um, the fields, some of the values, I, maybe I want, I don't know, a title, so uh, yeah, here, here's a, a list of fields that I will get. Oh, maybe I actually don't need the body. Yeah, I remove that. Whatever, okay, so you, these are the fields that I, I need from, from, the, from that content. I'm gonna save it, and, um, and here again in Postman, the tool that you can't see very well is, uh, I'm going to use this URL, I set it to API slash re recipes, and here it is. I get the list of, of the recipes, at least those fields that I, I wanted. So this is it, I did not write a line of code, I, did not, I, I was just using the, the UI of, of um, Drupal, and look at it, I'm, I'm, I can communicate with other systems. And there, I don't really want to go into to the deal. I mean, uh, just wanted to, I, I created another endpoint for, for updating, uh, updating a node, so this is, uh, this one requires authentication in the, this Postman tool. You can easily just uh, enter your, your username and, and password. You set the header, uh, so when you post something, you set what the, for, the format for it. And this is, the, this is what, you, what we, um, yeah, sorry. Um, well, yeah, so here it was. The, the, So whatever, okay, uh, so this is it, you can, you can, let's say I want to uh, rename the node to like Drupal NYC and, um, and send it. And here it is, if I go to node number one, here in the content list, you can see that the title is now Drupal NYC. So, this is it. You can easily just expose the, all the content uh, to consuming and also to manipulation through APIs with Drupal 8. Uh, thank you very much. This is, uh, this is all I got. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Hi, um, does this have a uh, built-in cross-site capability, the cause thing built into? Um, yes. Out of the box. I, um, okay, you know what, that I, I, um, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I, I, this is, I, I, yeah, I'm, it does, okay, so yes, it does. All right, any other questions? All right, thanks. All right, uh, now we have a little longer presentation. Uh, uh, Chris will be giving us a introduction to views. You guys did kind of just get a, uh, an introduction to views there, um, but I'll give you a much better one. Well, much better, much more in-depth one. Um, let's get this up. Did I press something? It's like magic that this is up. Yeah, what's the magic?
resolution. Sorry, guys. All right. Can you see me here? Okay. So, um, first order of business, um, my wife uh, has noted that I have kind of a habit of staying out drinking with you guys till the wee hours of the morning, so uh, she put the crack down and said, I have to be home by 10, so the quicker I get through this, the quicker we go out drinking, the better things are. Um, so, uh, I'll blaze through this pretty quick. Um, uh, basically, uh, so I'm Chris Porter. I work as the Director of Application Development for a Portland, Maine-based company called the North Cross Group. Uh, we do a lot of things, including consulting. Uh, I mostly now focus on our uh, internal application development efforts. Uh, we do uh, a lot of compliance and, and uh, incident management uh, applications. Um, in a former life, I was an Aquian. Um, I worked with them for about five years. I was their 35th employee, and I was part of their professional services uh, group. Um, so I had to present on you know, a lot of things like how to use Drupal, how to um, you know, kind of jumpstart groups. We would do these one-week presentations or one-week sessions where we would work with teams, get them to you know, fully understand you know, everything from installing Drupal to actually um, you know, becoming like a development team and developing sites. Um, and since then, uh, you know, I presented triple cons. I try to do the one-day sessions. There's a, if you've ever been, there's a uh, on Mondays. There's a training, training day where uh, for eight hours you get a hands-on course. Um, definitely check them out if you're if you're into this. They're always super valuable. Uh, occasionally, I get accepted to do them. Um, so, anyways, the we're here to talk about views. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to it as soon as I can figure out how to get out of this full screen mode. There it is. Um, just make this full screen here. Uh, and I'll start with a quick story about this. You guys kind of just, you actually had a very similar experience to what I had uh, in the uh, decoupled uh, for beginners session a second ago where he showed you the view screen and you probably saw that if you've never seen it before and you just said, whoa, like there's just a huge amount of stuff. It's really like, it's, it's crazy. Um, so uh, my very first, when I was in professional services, my very first client was actually B&H Photo right around the corner. Um, and they, um, I had been brought on to, uh, you know, with my, at the time, Drupal 4 experience. And Views 2 had, you know, just come out. It was a you know, really useful tool even back then, albeit slow, kind of inefficient. Um, and I knew it top to bottom, inside out. And um, that was the big thing that they wanted to learn, but for Drupal 5, and this was you know, back in the Drupal 4 days. Um, and with, with that, Views version 3 had come out with their new interface, and I had never seen it before. And I was like, how different can it be? And so I showed up, I'm like, all right, you know, everybody's ready, it's you know, 9.30 fire up the screen, and I click view. I clicked, I uh, started here, which is roughly the same. There's a list of views on the screen. I'm like, cool, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna click uh, add a view. And what came up was a screen I didn't expect. It looked totally <laughs> different from, uh, from what I was used to, and it looked like this. And it's, it's rare that I freeze. I froze, I just, uh, uh, what is this? I have no idea. I, I we had to actually kind of postpone that for later in the day because I had to, I needed to actually immerse myself in this and figure it out. And um, this happens a lot. You'll find like as you're going through Drupal, you'll find these areas that like you know you thought you knew, and then suddenly it's radically different. Um, so this screen is terrifying. Um, and uh, interestingly, it's a lot better than it was, but it still is like. There's so much to consume on this, and there's um, uh, there's there's nothing that tells you where to start. You know, you look at this. What do I do? What what, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to work with this? It's very challenging. Uh, it was actually rated one of the worst Drupal interfaces uh, or aspects of Drupal a few years ago. Still hasn't really changed. Um, so, you know. As you're going through this and you're, you're digesting what's, what's being talked about, trust me, I understand when you're like, I don't get it. Um, and we'll, we'll get through it. So um, the first question is, what is views? Um, 
you've, you've heard a lot about creating content, live editing content, uh, moving blocks around, doing all these things and that. Um, invariably, you're gonna get to a point where you need to show two pieces of content on the same screen, or three pieces of content on the same screen, or you know, uh, make a paginated list. That's all views is. At its core, all it is is a thing that makes lists of content. And then you get to decide how you wanna show them. Like what, you know, what, th what parts of that content do you wanna show? How do you want your users to interact with that list of stuff? Um, the easiest example to start with is um, with this Umami uh, demo app, which I just wanna tell you guys, uh, Five minutes before I walked up here, I realized, well, you know, I decided to throw away the demo app that I built for this and use this instead because I had totally forgotten it existed. Um, so I'm really happy that it's here. It's got a lot of nice, nice content. Um, but we can start with this. So your first thing is, I want to know what's, like, just show me a list of all the content on this site. And what's the keyword there? It's a list. This is a list of content. Um, so what we're seeing here is, you know, each piece of content and what's you know, important things about it. The title, uh, what kind of content it is, who made it, what the status of it is, um, when it was changed last, and then there's some operations here. Um, you can edit it or delete it. Um, what's important about this, this used to not be a view. Uh, in Drupal 7, this was initially just some straight up, you know, code that someone wrote and that was the, the page where you manage this. So when you wanted to do things like say, well, title's important, but I also want to know about the, um, you know, is it highlighted flat uh, that you've added to your piece of content? Uh, you couldn't put that field in here. You had, to, you had to actually override this display with a view and then make that happen. Um, Drupal 8 at least turned around and said, well, now that views is part of core, so it's, it comes packaged with Drupal 8, um, now we have a pre-built view that is just always in operation and always working. And so that's what we're looking at here. Um, so you can pretty much see that that's, you know, that, that you can you know, make some modifications here. So the question is, how do you compose this? How do you build uh, a view that does these things? And um, that gets us back to, you know, this, the scary screen of doom. Um, <laughs> this is, the view for that. Um, basically, what this is saying is, uh, I have these fields that I'm interested in, and these are the things that I'm gonna present on the title. Is this really small or off the screen? Um, so I'll zoom in on this. Um, so the, I, where to start? Just uh, start on the left column, or top to bottom, middle column, et cetera, and, we'll, and that's how we're gonna go through this. So. We have fields. These are the fields that we're interested in. These are the fields we're gonna show. Um, if you wanted to add more fields, you have a nice add button. Uh, if you wanna rearrange them, you can rearrange them with this. Um, they all have, uh, when you click on the titles of them, uh, you're given a nice, you know, some configuration attributes that you wanna work with here. Um, this is so powerful that you will get yourself into trouble you know, very quickly and you'll love it, it's, it's awesome. Um, you can do things like you can rewrite what's, you know, what comes out for the title uh, or for the data for that field. Uh, you can specify if there's no data what you say. Um, you can do uh, just all kinds of fun things. It supports tokens so you can embed the values from other fields in here. Um, you know, so you can combine fields together. Uh, it's, it's, it's awesome and it's, it's super versatile. The, You'll, you'll run into this later and you'll say, you know, I remember him saying this. The only caveat to this is if you want to use a token, say like you want to put another field's value in the field you're working with, that field has to be in here before the other one. Otherwise it won't show up. Um, so this list here probably directly correlates to uh, this list here. So these columns here are, you know, they're exactly the same, uh, same list. So uh, the next thing is our filter criteria. This is what is um, reducing what you see in the list down to the specific things that you're interested in, you want your users to be interested in. Um, 
you can do some cool stuff with these things. Um, you know, the, uh, I, and there's the, uh, I'll have an anecdote about this in a second, but um, you can put in a filter that is, uh, that users are able to interact with or that are just part of this view so that, you know, no matter what, that's the filter that applies. So in this case, this view is, uh, has a filter that says only show content that is uh, published or uh, you know, if not published, you have to be an admin user to see it. That's a special magic uh, filter that they've added. Um, then they've offered these other ones like the uh, content title. So there's a filter for title. By default, it's not going to have any value in it. So um, it's not going to filter by that title. See, and that's blank. So here we're saying this is the properties of the title filter. Um, make it just one. Uh, you know, give it a label of title. Uh, make sure that whatever a user types into that text field, uh, make sure that it uh, this field contains that value. Uh, if you wanted a default filter for that, you can put that in here. Default text to filter by, you put that in here. Uh, and then uh, it's exposed, and that's how you're able to configure this. Um, if you had you know, astute users that you could trust to not get themselves in trouble, um, you could expose the operator. And this would let the user choose uh, if, you know, in all of these, which thing they want to use. So like, if you want them to, uh, if your power user's like, I need a title that doesn't end with, um, God, what's, the, um, what's the thing with Seinfeld where all of the titles start with uh, the or end with the place or something like that? Um, you could do something like that. And then they'd have the ability to say, well, show me the one title that doesn't have that. Um, you can give them that. I, I would make a pretty solid argument that nobody uses that. Um, so that's there for you. And you'll see, like, um, if we go back here, we've got the title is exposed. It even gives you a handy little notice that um, it is exposed. It says it right here. Um, and we can see these exposed filters here. And we see that they are exposed here. So uh, one problem with this, and uh, I call this the, um, the Star Trek display, it's, it's, or Star Trek dashboard. Basically, it's, you can wind up uh, with, a, uh, with a situation where you have tons of exposed filters. Uh, there's actually, there's a discussion, if you guys are on Facebook and you uh, subscribe to the Drupal Facebook, or Drupal support Facebook group, I'm kind of an active uh, participant in that. Uh, and I think the top three things that people ask about are views, one of the top three. Um, there's a discussion where someone's creating a profile site and uh, they're also learning Drupal and so they're using that as their, their uh, example. And they've posted their, the form for this and it's a view and it's listed all the profiles it's nice in like a grid format. And there's like 70 different exposed filters. And you know, you fill that out and it's basically gonna be it's very easy to get into a situation with these exposed filters where um, you, you can configure those fields to give you no results. And then you have no idea why you got no results. I mean, your users are going to get really confused. Like, well, you know, is it, uh, is it because I selected this and this? Or is it that I picked the wrong region? Or, and they've got to like figure that out. It's a very confusing uh, experience. So I would say if you're going to use exposed filters, just try to consider uh, what users are choosing uh, with that versus what you can actually do to reduce that. Um, or reduce that choice and provide easier choices for them. Uh, there's more on that in a second. Um, so, uh, the next thing is our sort criteria. Um, this is just gonna tell you, or you know, tell the view uh, how stuff should be presented. Um, in, in, in what order, either ascending or descending. There's uh, an important thing about this is this follows the, the, this tool is just building a SQL statement. So uh, if you know SQL, kind of show of hands, who's used SQL before? Yes. Who knows what a left join is? Who's used a left join? Who can tell me what the difference between a left join and an inner join is? Also, uh, most people are raising their hands. This is awesome. Um, Cool. So we're, 
this is awesome. So, um, sort criteria, if you know, if, you, if you've done this with SQL, you know that um, it's, if you specify two fields in sort criteria, it's going to sort by the first one, and then uh, of the values that are the same in the first one, it's going to sort the, using the second field within that. And views is no different. And that trips a lot of people up because they kind of want it to sort uh, both fields somehow together, and that's not what it does. Uh, it d does like an internal sort uh, based on group. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so uh, the other thing is, since you guys all speak SQL here, yes. um, we can talk about this right here. Um, so what, we've, what we're looking at is if this is a very classic SQL statement, and I've put in all the important words. Um, we're talking about the select statement uh, and which area of the, in, I want you guys to all just kind of yell these things out as loud as you can. Um, so which area of that view interface covers the select part of a query? Fields, right? Yep. Cool. And now, this is a tricky one. Where does the from come from? Right. It, it comes from the, and I didn't actually tell you this part, it comes from the base entity of the view. Uh, that's something, uh, you know, the title of this presentation is starting off right. This will be the thing that trips you up the most, is where do you start? What entity do you start with? Um, so when you first create the view, you're going to say that. So we know this view was a content view. It even says it in parentheses right here. Um, that's the from, is from content. Uh, if we created taxonomies, we could do this in the, uh, it would say, you know, taxonomy in parentheses there. If we had created a view that started with that. Okay, so that's the from. And then we get to, we're going to skip these for a minute, because this is part of the advanced section. Uh, the where clause, where does that come from? Filters, right? Cool. Uh, group by, we can skip for a second. And the order by. Sort. So that's like, this right here is pretty much, you know, all the stuff you need to start your SQL query. So if you just think about a SQL query the way you want to write it, this right here is going to get you there. Uh, everything else is sort of meta around how to present that query to your users. Um, so uh, the next thing is we have uh, different kinds of displays for our views. Um, what's interesting about views is it doesn't, the administrative interface for it doesn't start off by showing you uh, the, uh, the default values of stuff. It's, um, so like when you're looking at this, there's actually another display here called master. And uh, all displays inherit from that master display. Uh, so uh, this is a page display, and with it comes the properties for how to present this view, or this, this data, on a web page. And here is the area where that happens. Right here in the middle, big and bold, the page settings. So with this, you get to choose a path, and that's a path that the user can navigate to. And when they go to that path, it's going to Query the database, it's going to get that content together, it's going to list it in whatever format you've told it to list it in. Uh, provide any exposed filters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you need to put a message at the top, some you know, friendly text like, you know, this is my content, uh, you have the header here. And here you can add different kinds of uh, stuff. There's a lot of stuff, and every time I look at this, I see new stuff. Um, importantly, uh, and probably the most common is under global. You can do just a text area right here. And here I could say, I want to add a text area. I'm going to have it say, look at all this yummy content, because this is a recipe site. Apply. Save this. And if I come back here, Refresh. I now have in very tiny letters here. Look at all this yummy content. That's that header. Right there. Um, so let's go back and refresh. 
Um, and so I could do the same with the footer as well. And this is just, you know, kind of lightly surrounding all the stuff with more stuff. Um, so let's say that I like this view, but it shows too much stuff. And I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm good with it, but I want to create uh, another display that uses the same values here, but filters by, you know, it down just so that it's a little bit more, um, a little more targeted to what I'm interested in. Uh, what I can do is add another display. I create another page display. So now I've got these two here, and it nicely says page two. Um, I can change that to something better, like my content. And give it a nice description, because we all document our functionality, right? Um, I'm going to say shows the content of the, act, the active user. Active it. And it's nice right net. They didn't clone the path, which is good. Uh, I'm going to change the path here, and we're going to call it uh, what content mine, my content. And that's going to be the URL path that's on the site this page delivers. And so now I'm free to customize this with one little caveat. Um, this has inherited all the configuration from that master display, which that page display is also using. Uh, so the thing that's going to trip you up the second most, probably the most in this, is right here. I'm going to add a filter, and I'm going to say, I hope this will work, active user. Uh, user. Um, authored by. It's author, right? User we'll do this. Save. Ah, see, I just screwed it up. Um, this right here is the bane of every views developer's existence. Um, what this is saying is, add this field, do it for all displays. So I just put it on this other display as well, the one I didn't want to modify. And so I'm going to remove this. We're going to come back to it. And we're going to add. And we'll do authored by. This is good. I don't know where that was before. Um, oh, almost did it again. For this page. And I don't know why they chose to you know, say for new displays that it just automatically applies to everything instead of the one you're working on, but they did. Um, so you know, make sure that if you're customizing this for just this one display, that you always look up here first. And it's also in a place that isn't you know, it doesn't really, your eye doesn't really jump to right away, so it's going to be very easy to miss, and you're going to miss it all the time. Um, so, I've got this. I'm going to say just for this page, the authored by, and I'm going to hit apply, and I should be able to say, it doesn't let me do it. All right. Um, is one of, and I'm going to say just, just me. And I should probably change my description of this because it's now showing only the admin user stuff. It shows the content of the admin user. And if I save this now, I should then be able to go to slash my content right here. It's another fun thing about um, uh, Drupal. You can see this is my tab uh, counter right here. Uh, I have 82 tabs open right now. Just brace yourself for that as you start developing. Um, and they're all hiding down here. But um, I, I go tab crazy. So we can see there's no content. This The admin user has not created any content here, so this doesn't list anything, which is fine. Um, but now I've got this nice display. You can see the URL here. Um, and it's now reducing that. So if I went as admin and created content, it would show in this list in that nice table format that we all uh, know and love. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of displays. Uh, where did I go? Right here. Oh, right. Um, so 
a whole bunch of different kinds of displays. You saw there's like the RESTful one if you enable the, uh, the services modules. Um, you can create a block that you can then go position anywhere uh, you want on the user interface. Or you, you can create an embed which allows you to embed it in things. Um, when you get really advanced and you start doing your data architecture stuff, uh, you're going to have entity references between two different things. Like you might have content that is a page and content that is a company. And you might say, well, this company owns this page. Um, and then you would um, need to reduce that. So you want to create a view that helps control the list of things, the list of companies that you see in that entity reference field. Um, you can create a feed, which I don't know if they have use that anymore, it's the RSS feed, um, and, or more pages. Uh, when you start using panels, you can create new uh, uh, panel components, and it, the, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's the, the yeah, I just showed you every, every single thing in like two seconds here. Uh, now we get to the advanced area. Um, and this is, Probably the coolest thing is the contextual filters area, and this is what you'll use the most. This and relationships. Um, contextual filters, you see like URLs where um, a specific value is provided in the URL, not as a drop down like that Star Trek dashboard, but like um, you know, in the URL so that you know, you, your users don't see that. It's just some other navigational system, navigational structure has said, uh, go here to see like these recipes that look like this. Um, the, that's where this happens. The, that magic happens with context filters. So we could look at, um, actually, let's take a look, let's create another page. Um, and this one, what we're going to say is, in the URL, I'm going to pass the ID of the user that I want to see the content for. So I can create a page, and this one is going just leave it at page three for now. Um, create the, this user content, and we're going to leave it blank. Um, so, uh, if if you ever get one of my uh, jumpstart sessions, which are the week long training sessions, uh, I go through three rules for using Drupal. Um, rule number one is always read the fine print, and uh, this is like super valuable information and it's really tiny and not uh, it's like the, the text is muted a little bit so you don't you're not even going to see it to read it uh, but it's really useful it'll tell you some cool stuff about how you can create URLs and pass values into there and blah 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 and the, this whole interface is littered with these things uh, there's a classic one when I'm challenging people to recreate the content view um, it says if you want to show the username Add the relationship to the user, but no, like it's. I mean, it's right there, and everybody's like, "Oh, I'm just gonna hit add on user, just user or something rather," and uh, it totally misses it. And it's really important, like, every, just consume and digest every piece of text that this interface presents to you, because that's like, you know, it's that's what makes you makes you awesome. Um, I'm gonna call this user content and. Uh, we're not going to put the percent that they recommend in here because we can add that later. Uh, what they're saying here is you can put a placeholder value uh, wherever you want to ingest a value into, as a filter value, into your view, um, which is what context filters do. So uh, where filters allow users to you know, choose from a control and, select, and supply a value, context filters contextually receive that value from somewhere else. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the URL. <clears throat> so I'll do user content and apply that. And then in our advanced, we're going to add for this display the uh, user ID. So, you know, one of the great things about uh, views is whatever the um, whatever the base, whatever entity it knows that it's rendering, it will find all of the fields and all the definitions for those things. Um, if uh, 
in that example that I was talking about a second ago, if we hadn't added the relationship to users, this user ID field wouldn't be here. It wouldn't know about how to, um, it wouldn't let you put any fields in that talk about users because it didn't know that it's supposed to show them. Uh, it would only show you things about content. But because this view has been configured to show content and the users associated with that content, you get this nice extra, you know, bunch of stuff about users. Uh, so we're gonna say user ID here and apply. And it gives you some, some fun stuff here. Um, this read the fine print thing is really cool. Um, you could do these like display a summary. Um, so this is basically saying if, no, if the URL has arrived and there wasn't a number in the URL, like it, just, it was just blank, uh, what should happen? Should it say, you know, that you got to give me this data, like is it required? Or can it, can it gracefully handle it by say showing everything? Um, the, and then there's other options like um, display a summary. This one's neat because what it would do is it would say, um, in this case, um, it would show all the users and the content, the account of the content associated with those users. So you could choose one of those users and then it'll actually show you that data. Uh, that's really handy if you want to start doing like a facet style uh, display where you know, users can't, they can click on things to reduce the data, but they can never click on so many things that they get zero data. Um, that's, and that's, that's a really, really powerful, powerful tool right there. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, yeah, don't show it. Like, it's required. You have to supply user ID for this view, or for, for this display. Um, then you can validate it. So I can say when a value is provided, uh, specify validation criteria. You could say make sure that that number lines up with being a user. Or make sure it's an actual user ID. Um, you could even allow more IDs. But what's cool about this is it knows what kind of data it's supposed to be and allows you to kind of tailor uh, the, the results around that. So I'm gonna say cool, apply. And we can even go down and test this. So see how it says no query was run here? Uh, that means that it failed validation. So if you were to have gone to this URL, it would have said 404, this page is not found because you, know, you didn't give me an ID. So now I can slap a one in here to test this. And you can see in that fine print, it says separate your context filters with a slash. So we only have one context filter here, so we only need to put one value in. I can do that and say update. And see, now I get some data and I get those controls, but there was no content for user one, so nothing showed up. Uh, I'm actually kind of curious who owns this content, so let's take a look real quick. Uh, user four. So I can come up here and put a different value in. Go four, update, and we should see some stuff. There you go. Um, so in, now, if I were to save this view, go to that URL, you can actually see it in, in action, save. Cool, and we go here, what do we call it, user content. So user content without anything, page not found, right? User content with a value on the end of it, and we get that page with some stuff. Now, the reason this looks so not nice is because it's not using the admin theme like it was over here. Uh, that's a topic for another time, but uh, you could, you, there, there are ways to specify that path as part of the admin theme. So, um, now, uh, I'll cover two more topics, then we can do a question and answer, because it's 8.22 now, and I know that we all want to go have a beer, right? Um, so the first thing is, I talked about, um, how scary that user interface was that you just sort of jump in, that I, you know, they just, I got thrown into way back in the day, and how that's different now. Um, you can thank Acquia for this. They sponsored, uh, what about seven years ago, six years ago? They sponsored an initiative to make the views user interface easier. Um, and so they created this wizard right here. Um, the great part about it is it is a good like Kickstarter for creating a view. The bad thing is once you use this, uh, 
and you start your view, you can never come back to this to change anything. So uh, it's there, but uh, it was a big community effort, uh, largely sponsored by Acquia. Um, and you know, it lets you do some you know, quick uh, basic stuff. So uh, you create a basic page, or sorry, a basic view. And uh, you choose the base entity you want to work with here. Um, and you see these are the options. Um, this is that thing I was telling you about where if you choose it wrong here, um, you, you're going to have to start over. You have to throw it out and go back, create a new one, and then start again. Um, this is important because eventually you're going to get to a point where you want to construct a, um, a display that shows, that has relationships. And you want to show one thing and other things if they exist. Uh, a really classic example is, uh, let's say that you have a site that has companies and those companies have employees. And you want to say, show me all companies that don't have employees. Um, here's a quick SQL question for you. What kind of join will let you do that? You guys all raised your hands about this left join thing. Um, in SQL, what kind of join would you use to say, show me all companies that don't have employees? Left join, or left outer join, yeah. Um, so, uh, what a lot of people wind up doing is like, well, I'm actually really interested in the employees. They start with the employee entity, and then they join in the companies. And then like, now I want to take this and I want to show the companies that don't have any employees, but you can't do that because you started with the employees. So you'll never get zero, you'll, you'll never get a null record for your, for your employees. So it's really important that you start with the entity that is the, um, the most interesting one and then kind of tack on through relationships the other entities as, as you need them. Um, and sometimes you'll wind up in the frustrating situation if you have a view that like properly captures in 15 displays all the aspects of the thing you're working with, and then uh, you have that. Well, I need to turn this over and you know show you know this other side. Then you gotta go create another view and do this other thing. Now you got two views that manage the functionality that one should do. And it's it's a it you know, just keep in mind that this is in itself SQL uh, being generated, and so you just kind of have to follow follow along with that. Um, so yeah, you show you, you choose your base entity type. Um, and in this case, we can say like users. Uh, it'll adjust if it knows more about it. And then uh, you say whether you want to create a page, whether you want to create a block. Uh, and if you don't want to do either of those, you just want to start configuring, then you just save it. And then boom, you're back at the you know, giant screen of Doom. Um, so um, if you're a SQL head like me, you're going to get to a point where you've configured your view and you don't know why it's not working. And this is super common. You have you know, 15 filters, you've got three relationships, and you've got uh, a context filter here and there, and like it's just not behaving. You're getting multiple records when you meant to get one, or you're getting like duplicates, or you're getting, and you wanna try and figure out why that's not working. Um, you want to enable the, um, show the SQL option. And this, I, I would bet if you asked, I, I, in fact, I'm gonna bet, we've got some Drupal developers here. Who knew that this settings tab existed for views? Okay, good, I like you guys. Um, like, for the record, I think 20 people raised their hands. Um, I think they knew because I pointed at it, but yeah. Um, anyways, so you got these cool pieces of function, or cool options here and switches you can work with. I'll come back, zoom in. Uh, and the one I mentioned is specifically is show the SQL query. If you do this and you just say above and then you save it, uh, performance stats are really nice. Um, save that and then you go back to your view that you're working on. Um, now when I click update, it gives me this cool thing, query, and then it shows me the written out query. Um, this will save your bacon. Uh, you know, almost every time. Because you're going to see that, like, the wrong, fi wrong field is being filtered and it's got the value it's not supposed to have. And, um, you know, you're gonna, you'll quickly diagnose what happened there. Um, 
Also something you'll be really surprised about is that more or less, once you're familiar with how the data architecture of Drupal and the content types and entities are, um, it writes the SQL pretty much exactly the way you would. So um, don't discount it and think, oh, you, you'll hear a lot of, a lot of FUD about you know, views creates really slow SQL queries and blah, blah, blah. They're as, by and large, as effective as if you wrote them yourself and you just get this nice, like, you know, display layer uh, packed on top of it. So um, really take advantage of that as you're debugging your views. And the last thing is, um, most people don't use this, but I find it to be pretty important. Uh, always show the master display. Um, when you get into uh, doing advanced views and you've got context filters, and specifically you're creating content, context filters that uh, act like facets, uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a master display. And uh, you're gonna configure it to show what you need. You're gonna add all of your context filters that you could even imagine needing. And then you're gonna run off a new display for, you know, one for essentially each of those context filters, and then make some light changes. And then at some point you're like, oh, no, I need to revise the, um, revise a property on all of them. And it's really tricky if you don't know to go to master and then make that change there. So, um, you know, most people don't particularly care about this, but this is really handy for that. Also, it's handy if you, uh, like I did in the very beginning, if you accidentally add a filter or add a field or add, add something to all displays and you want to get rid of it, um, you could just switch over to master and delete there versus deleting it and then doing that. Or if you want to keep it in one, you just override it and then go to master and delete it. So, um, also a very handy tool. Um, so yeah, that in a nutshell is every single configuration <laughs> in views in, what, 40 minutes? Um, ask me anything you want and I'll tell you more than you want to know about it. Ready, set, go. Question over there. Um, just quick question, right? Under under what sort of conditions would you would you see the usage of views as being applicable um, in a block context, right? Versus the usage of certain things like collections of entity references that that could be rendered by that block. Yeah. So um, that's that's th there was a much easier answer to that before Drupal eight. Um, where you didn't have the ability to take, say, a field for a piece of content and place, um, and place that field in a, in a different region of the page. Um, Drupal 8 has that now, so you kind of rely a little bit more on the entity reference to uh, list everything for you. But a really good example would be, uh, maybe you don't trust that your users ordered the stuff in that entity reference correctly. Um, so, uh, in that situation, what you do is you just create a block that contextually receives the piece of content that you're interested in, that lists the, and filters it by you know, that entity reference field as a relationship. Um, and then you do the sorting on it. And so then you're controlling the sorting versus allowing the entity reference field to like kind of have that property. Um, also, you would want to run that off and like, you might have multiple ways you want to present that field, and that entity reference field is only going to let you do it in one, one sorting. So that would be like one, one good example. Um, but uh, as far as blocks go, like usually you're gonna do these as like, you should be doing this as kind of like standalone independent uh, lists of content that aren't necessarily, lists of things that are not necessarily tied to what you're looking at. So like the who's online is a really good example. Like that's not tied to the page or, page or piece of content you're looking at, it's just a handy little block that shows you who's, who's logged in. Um, and that's more of what the view blocks are kind of for, unless you're doing like the contextuals or things like that, so, or uh, facets or something like that. Uh, next question. Ah, drum rose his hand, for it. rose his hand, I need a beer. Um, but he was just scratching. Anybody, anybody? All right. Well, that's, that's it for me. Thank you all very much. And uh, here we have
All right. I'm back. I thought you were done with me. Uh, we're almost done here. We just got a few closing slides here uh, with a whole bunch of information. Um, first up, our next meetup uh, is Wednesday, April 3rd. Uh, if you have the meetup app on your phone, you could even RSVP for that right now, or you can go to that URL. Uh, that'll take you to meetup. Um, and I just realized I don't have a clicker. Is this a clicker? Wow. <laughs> okay, so our next, next meetup is tentatively scheduled for May 1st. Uh, that's tentative because we don't actually have a venue for May 1st. Uh, NBC has been a, a fantastic uh, sponsor for our venue and pizza, but on May, in, during the month of May, <laughs> they're unavailable. Um, so uh, we don't yet have a confirmed venue uh, for May. So if you work for a company um, uh, you know, that could provide some, some space, you know, we need Wi-Fi, we need projection, um, uh, room for at least 40 people, um, although certainly capacity for more is, is appreciated. Um, if, if you have you know, a lead on that, please contact any organizer. Um, you can get us through Slack or um, you know, you'll find one of us somehow. <laughs> uh, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, okay, so uh, you know, these meetups don't happen without our speakers. Uh, thank you to all our fantastic speakers uh, today and, and every day. Um, can I see a show of hands? How many people have presented at a Drupal NYC meetup before? Cool, okay. Uh, how many people have presented at a different Drupal event, but not Drupal NYC. We would absolutely love to get you guys uh, presenting at Drupal NYC. Uh, let's see a show of hands. People who have not presented about Drupal, but might be interested in it. You're not committing. Great, one, two, three, super. Four, great, okay. So I want you guys, come find me. <laughs> come find me, let's chat about you know things you might be able to, to talk about. Uh, we'll help you, you know, get it all set up and, and you know, uh, help you with topics if you don't know what topic you might want to present on. Um, come find me or any other organizer uh, tonight, ideally, <laughs> and uh, you know we can pencil you in for a future date, no commitment, um, but we'll get the process going. Um, also, uh, this is all volunteer run event. Um, we're always looking for more volunteers. If you're interested in uh, becoming an organizer, um, you know, find an organizer. <laughs> we love the help. So uh, our after party is sponsored by Fastly today, as you know. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is the last day, uh, the last meetup that they're sponsoring for us. They've been a great longtime sponsor. Uh, we really appreciate um, all their support for the community. Uh, again, if you work for a company, um, or uh, maybe you're independently wealthy, and uh, <laughs> you want to uh, sponsor uh, our after party, um, as you'll see tonight if you haven't been before, it's a lot of fun, uh, and, and we would love your help. Um, so please do reach out. Uh, okay, so back, back. you know, this is the, the meetup for, for people new to Drupal. Um, so a few resources uh, for Drupal newbies. Um, you know, there's documentation on drupal.org. Uh, there's the Drupal NYC Slack channel. Uh, that's specific to this meetup in the New York City community. Um, so a lot of people in this room are already on there. Um, and we encourage everybody to join. Uh, if you haven't used Slack, it's, it's really easy to get started. Um, check that out. People are always happy to answer questions. Um, you could read a book. You know, search Amazon uh, for Drupal 8. You'll find a lot of great books out there. Um, that's how I originally learned Drupal, um, back with Drupal 6. Um, there are lots of videos out there. Drupal.tv, Drupal .tv, that's missing. Oh, yeah, thank you. Like Drupal.tv, um, great place to watch uh, sessions from uh, other Drupal events. And then there are videos online, uh, OS training on YouTube. Uh, Drupalize.me, buildamodule.com. Uh, some of those are have paid videos and some are free. Uh, another good resource. Uh, also, people in this room. Um, so we're going to try something a little different. We've never done this before. Uh, but I see a show of hands of people who are somewhat comfortable with Drupal and would be willing to talk with somebody who's new to Drupal or has questions just briefly at the end of the meetup. Um, show of hands. If y'all could just stand in that corner when we're done, right? <laughs> then newbies. I, I invite you to go bug, go pester these people with all your questions. They volunteered uh, to help you tonight, um, so definitely reach out. Uh, it's a great way to, to get connected to people in the community um, and start those discussions. And uh, they can also show you the way to the after party. <laughs> um, it's 24 degrees outside, so uh, there's an indoor route <laughs> to get there. Uh, so follow the people who, who look like they know where they're going, um, and we'll, we'll get, you, uh, get you some drinks before you have to go out in the cold. Um, let's see, do we have anything else we do? the after party. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>